Okay, good evening. Uh, time to get started. We're uh, going to look at um, the request that David made of Solomon and the request that Solomon uh, makes of David. And these two things are in 1 Kings 2 and 3. So you go ahead and turn there. If you've got the, we're using this uh, chronological Bible, the daily Bible, um, and that's, we're going to start on page 590. Uh, so if you've got that and want to just follow along through it sequentially, because some of, once you get out of the first couple chapters here, it kind of skips around into Chronicles to sort of get the whole narrative. So um, if you've got that, it might be a little bit easier to follow along. I'll try to give references as we go. Um, I didn't have time to put notes. Slides take a lot of time. I didn't have time to put notes together. Um, I'm kind of slammed right now with work, so... Um, Anyway, as you're looking through, hopefully you can just um, get a lot out of just reading through the text and getting through the narration. There's a whole bunch of what I think are very important principles that are being taught. Um, and one of the things I think is interesting, because we're going to kind of, um, here in a few chapters, we're going to sort of jump out of the narrative part of it and get into Proverbs um, <clears throat> before, um, right after the temple dedication of, in Solomon's life. Just like we did with Psalms, um, as we get towards the temple dedication, then it sort of jumps over to Psalms. Obviously, doing things chronologically, not all the Psalms are written by David, and not all the Proverbs are written by Solomon. Um, but what you're going to see is, in these two requests, you're going to see sort of the the way both of these men are, and, um, and how they relate to God. Each one of them uh, relates to God very differently. And uh, as well, it, it sort of helps us understand why the Proverbs are the way that they are. Most of the Proverbs are ri written as warnings. And, um, and, and it is that way, n not just because of Solomon's own life, but because of what he witnessed in his dad's life. And I think that's, that's how we all learn, is we, um, we see things that happen in other people's lives. It serves as a warning. Maybe we don't heed the warning, but it, it definitely instructs us and we see that in Solomon early on in the things that he's already witnessed in his dad just the stress of his life and by the time we talked about this on Sunday by the time David hits 70 he's already like Moses was at 120 Moses gets to live 50 years longer than David does and it's not because the generations add up and people at that time were living longer it has nothing to do with that it has to do with just the stress of everyday life. And Moses had a lot of, of stress, um, but David just had it exponentially more. And you see those kind of hard living concepts throughout the Proverbs. And you're also going to see <clears throat> the consequence of decisions. And that is one of the most important concepts in Scripture, is the consequence of decision. That you cannot remove consequence from the idea of free will or free choice. If, if you're able to actually make a choice for yourself, then of necessity, there is consequence to each choice. And this is an important thing as you study through Solomon's life, see how it, he reflects David in some ways, how he learns from David. And then the things that he writes in Proverbs, um, you see that he's writing about those very specific things. I mean, the main things he talks about in Proverbs are things like money and stress and sex and uh, just wisdom as a choice that you either want wisdom or you don't. Well, that part of the narrative is actually in tonight's reading. And, um, and, and some of what is, uh, we are reading as well is, I'm not going to cover tonight. I want to save all of the temple. There's the temple... Um, construction and all of the instructions about how they're to make the temple basically twice as big as what the tabernacle was and then there's the dedication of it and we're going to talk about that on Sunday so tonight we're really just going to look at these two requests one by David and one by Solomon um, I don't know of any um, announcements we need to make we were hopeful that we were going to hear something on the building and apparently we are back to waiting. So the people who we were in contact with, I think Greg was in contact with them. And um, they're telling us that we're still waiting on the state. So, you know, can't, I don't think you can win when you're fighting bureaucracy. 
So um, we're just back to waiting. Um, and this coming Sunday, don't forget, we're going to be meeting back at um, the UK, um, uh, what's it called? Extension office where um, Greg Jr. works. And apparently a lot of other people, Tracy, Felicia, I don't know who all works there. Um, anyway, so we'll be back there on Sunday. And then I think starting after that, we're all going to convert to Presbyterianism. And uh, I'm just kidding, but um, David Hawker has been generous, generous enough to allow us to go over there and start meeting. But we're going to have to meet uh, kind of early, so that's going to put some people out. So we know that. Sorry, but we're out of a building, so... Um, <clears throat> okay, that, I don't think I have any announcements other than that uh, that I need to make, so let's pray, and then we'll get right into our text. God, thank you for your word and for what it reveals to us about you and about your people, the relationship that you've always shared with us, what it tells us about your dwelling place, your desire to be among us, and we're thankful that you're not distant from us, that you are always uh, with us and that you want to be with us, even um, when we have issues in our life, we have sin, we have problems and struggle and conflict, that you still want to be with us, and we pray that we will, um, your will will be made known to us as we read through your word, uh, as your spirit dwells in us, help us to understand more fully what you want us to look like, how you want us to live, and we pray that our lives will reflect Jesus the Messiah, uh, so that we can be a light to the world and share the good news of Jesus with people who are around us. Help us to understand uh, what the good news is so that we can share it. Help us to uh, reflect him and not ourselves so that people will be attracted to um, the life that only Jesus uh, could give us. And we pray that um, when we look into your word tonight that it will change us this week and it will have impact in the weeks to come that we'll see um, your relationship with your people and how our relationships are supposed to be similar. They're supposed to be the same, and too often are not. Thank you for uh, our church. Thank you for our country, for our state and our cities. Thank you for all the good blessings of this life, for our health, and for our jobs, for um, our freedoms. and. We pray that um, as we take those things for granted that you'll simplify us and you'll change our hearts and that we will more closely reflect um, Jesus in our lives. And it's through him that we pray everything. Amen. Okay, so I don't have any slides for tonight. And um, so we're just going to get right into the text. Um, what we talked about on Sunday, let me, these pages are kind of thin. I always like to use my iPad or uh, phone, but I'm not doing that. So what we talked about Sunday was David is um, really sick, and you know at the uh, very beginning of First Kings, um, so they bring in this young lady who's virgin, and she has to be very attractive. All the people who are in the king's service uh, are attractive; they're the top of their class, whatever. That's just standard procedure. And so they bring in this lady, and the text specifically says he doesn't sleep with her. There's nothing sexual about this. It's, it's to keep him he, He's old, and something's wrong with him, as happens to a lot of old people, that they can't control their body temperature. And so, um, and we know this, you know, from history, that this is something that even at the time of uh, David and before that, that the way to treat someone like that was to have someone who basically just came in and laid with them. And, um, and so they, there's this young lady who's brought in. The thing is that outside the palace, outside um, this, even the city of Jerusalem, um, probably rumors float about this because David had multiple wives. He also had concubines. And so here is this woman who is brought in or this young lady who's brought in. And probably rumors were spreading about uh, the nature of the relationship. Did David, um, did he bring in another concubine because concubines were afforded some amount of uh, inheritance and rights. Um, and in fact, those uh, the women who were in the king's harem were passed along to the next king. And But, you know, you think of that however you want to, but the reality was back in that day that afforded them rights, uh, protections that other 
women did not enjoy. Uh, because at that time, women were sort of viewed as property. And so it was a protection for the women in a way that other women in society would not be protected. And so here's this young woman who's brought in, and um, I'm sure that outside of David's immediate circle, there are rumors about her. Is she a concubine? Is she even perhaps a wife? Um, and of course, as a wife, she would have different rights than the concubine. At any rate... The reason this is told at the, part, at the beginning of the story is because um, Adonijah is going to use this. He doesn't know what the nature of the relationship is, and he is an older brother. In fact, he's the fourth in line. Solomon is much later than that. And, um, and so because the older three brothers are dead, two of them, um, one killed another one, and then the other one gets killed by Joab, and then the other one, when he was born, seems to have been weak and probably passed away by this time, Shalab. Um, but the other two, Amnon and uh, Absalom, are both dead. And a lot of that happened because David was unwilling to act in those circumstances. And so Joab, his nephew, so Joab is, and his mom gets mentioned in this text a couple of times, um, Joab is the son of David's sister. Um, there were multiple sons and two sisters, and uh, both sisters are mentioned in the text in, I want to say, in First Chronicles, uh, maybe in the first couple of chapters there. There's a listing of David's, or uh, of Jesse's children, of which David is one of them. And anyway, so Joab is one of three boys born to one of David's sisters, and Joab is the only surviving uh, brother. So one of them uh, was killed by someone. And because, they, because Joab took vengeance on that man, then Joab is mentioned specifically within these texts. But it's not just because of that death. It's because of a couple of other things. Joab was also involved in the death of Absalom. He and his men killed Je uh, Absalom as he hung in the tree and was not able to get out. Um... And it doesn't seem like David knows that. That information was never, as far as we know, is not shared with David. And when David um, tells Solomon that he wants um, him to cause trouble for Joab, um, he doesn't mention that. But he does mention the death of these other uh, individuals that, jo that Joab, uh, these two people that Joab killed. And he tells him that um, you need to cause problems for him because of that. So... On page 591, this is uh, 1 Kings 2, and I don't know exactly what verse. Well, let's just start at verse 1. And so listen to the narrative. This is um, David giving instructions to Solomon about what he wants him to do um, uh, now that he has become king. Um, yeah, verse 1, uh, 1 Kings 2. For the, uh, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said, so be strong, act like a man. And remember, he's 19 or 20, and he actually might be as young as 12 or 13. So I'd say at the very oldest, he's 19 or 20. A lot of rabbis, even still today, teach that Solomon became king at about 12 or 13. And the reason they say that is because of some of the celebrations of manhood that are never said to have happened uh, for Solomon. And whether that proves that or not, at least we know he was very young. Um, so when, when David tells him to act like a man, he really does mean that. Um, because, you know, 12 or 13 would not be. So he says, so be strong, act like a man, observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. You know, it's an interesting thing when I talk about, or you know, maybe when you talk about the word of God, we just talk about it as being law. Or you might say the commandments. But it's people of the Old Testament, they had a different perspective of the law. And so there's lots of words that could be used. And it's sort of like Psalm 119 um, and Psalm 19. Anytime you hear Old, Old Testament Hebrews talking about the law of God, they might talk about it being precepts. Or they might talk about it being law or commandments or, or orders, whatever. But when he says decrees, commands, laws, regulations, I mean, it's just four of, you know, perhaps a hundred ways that you could say it. But to him, 
those things are somewhat different. And so he doesn't just say, keep the laws of God. He is saying that these legal regulations, these stipulations that are being placed on you through the law of Moses, you need to, you need to observe them. And just like any decent dad would do, he's, he's trying to give guidance about this. Now, we know David's been sort of a hands-off kind of a father figure. Not great. Um, but at least he is giving some instruction. So there's several verses of this really good stuff, and then it turns really bad. So he says, um, Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws, his regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do, and wherever you go, that the Lord may keep his promise to me. Um, and the, the, In other words, the initial covenant happens through David. David understands that. Solomon understands it. Um, and he says, if your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. So that's the good part of it. So, and now we enter the very bad part of it. So, you know, if you just, it would be nice if the narration would just stop right there. But now we go on to see the problems of David. Uh, he says, now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zariah, uh, did to me. Uh, my sister's son was a big jerk. So here we go. What he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and uh, Amasa, son of Jether, he killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. So, <clears throat> um, I promised him I wouldn't touch him, but you didn't make that promise, so you need to go ahead and make up for me. <laughs> so that that's actually the advice that is given to him in two places here. I always think that's interesting. When I die, I'm going to gather my sons to me, and I'm going to tell them, you know that jerk um, that lived down the street from us who was always, you know, uh, partying late at night? I couldn't do anything about that, but I want the, the four of you to go down there and beat him up a few times. I mean, that's, that's sort of the way that David is approaching to this. It's just, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but it's very interesting. His advice about Joab is, do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. So he's not saying go, go kill the guy. He's just saying um, harass him, right? But actually, Joab gives him reason to kill him, and he's going to do that in the next couple pages here. So that's why I'm dealing with this. Now, another guy is brought up here in the next paragraph, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillie, uh, of, of Gilead, and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. So these guys are, you know, they're, they're friendly. So don't forget them. Uh, and now, and then there's this last guy. Now, this guy was uh, the cursor of David. So... When David, and we talked about this briefly on Sunday, but when David uh, finally defeats the Philistines it is uh, and, and takes over uh, the kingdom from Saul, this guy is one of Saul's brethren. He is a fellow Benjamite, and so he is calling down curses on him. Now, we, you know, this wouldn't make much sense to us. We probably don't understand that, but um, curses of any kind and blessings of any kind in the Old Testament, in in the ancient world, were always believed to be true. So you, this is part of why in the book of Proverbs, it is uh, the way you're, the way you use your mouth is so discussed because you cannot just randomly bless people nor randomly curse people. And so here is a good example of that. You have this guy named Shammai who is um, cursing David uh, as he walks along the road. And when he comes back from battle, David decides not to kill him because he doesn't want to ruin the mood of the day. We beat the Philistines, that's good enough. So he doesn't touch this guy. Um, and he actually makes a promise to him that he won't. Um, but he doesn't promise Solomon won't. And so there you go. There's, there's the loophole. You know, um, having just done my taxes, um, I understand loopholes. And if you do your own taxes, you do as well. But this is, this is part of it is the loopholes of, you know, I won't kill you, um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But when I die, my son will. Okay, so he says, Remember you have with you uh, Shammai, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahurim, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mah I don't remember. 
When he came down to meet me in the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword, but now do not consider him innocent. So I said I wouldn't kill him, but he's not innocent. You are a man of wisdom. So this is the second time, the last time when David uh, was talking about Joab, he says, uh, deal with him according to your wisdom. And now he's saying basically the same kind of thing. You are a man of wisdom, and you will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. That is one of the most ominous statements in all of Scripture. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. He is giving him a direct command. You have to make sure this man is slaughtered. This is... It's fascinating because here is a man after God's own heart. He mentions three people on his deathbed. Two of them, you know, one of them he wants executed for sure. One of them, be nice to him. And the other one, just, you know, cause some trouble for him. Um, he's still family. Joab is still my nephew. And so I'm not telling you to kill him, but definitely don't let him die, you know, in an easy life. So that's, that's it. The next verse... In verse 10, then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He died at a good old age, that's disputable, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor, and his son his son Solomon succeeded him as king. So that's basically the end, and I, we've talked about this before. Um, the people of God, when they die, um, what is said about them? There's, no, there's never any fanfare. Abraham dies, and he rested with his fathers. Day, uh, Moses dies, and he rested with his father. Joseph, I mean, any character that we've learned to look up to and, and read their story and said, wow, I could never do that, when they die, there's just virtually nothing. He served the Lord, he died, it's done. And I think there's something, we, we think a lot more of death than the people who preceded us. And I think that there's something instructive about that. Um, they, they understood um, their place in time, um, understood their place in before the Lord, and they were servants before him, and that's it. And they served their purpose. As long as they served their purpose, then they are said to have wrestled with their fathers. And, and so here's David, a man after God's own heart. He dies, and that's it. The narration basically says nothing. And, you know, we don't know who wrote all of these things, but First Kings was probably written by... Uh, either Gad or Nathan, and that's it. There's there's nothing else to say about him. So as you get down to the bottom of page 591, there's this statement from First Chronicles 29, verse 35. The Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel ever had before. And this is absolutely true because um, of the request that Solomon's going to make. So let's deal with David's request to Solomon first. Um, which is what you find in the next couple pages here um, in First Kings. Really, most of chapter 2 is about Solomon um, dealing with the things that David told him right before he died. So if you're scanning through here in verse 19, you have Adonijah executed. Why is Adonijah his brother, the older brother, the fourth in line? Um, why is he executed? He's executed because he tries to use that young lady who was brought in um, as a way to the throne. And this is exactly why David um, did not, uh, well, I don't know that it's why, but it's one of the reasons why. He, does, he doesn't sleep, it's, there's no path through this young lady for someone else. And so, you know, there is, there is interaction here. Um, about this young lady, and Adonijah is going to try it because he thinks David has slept with her, and so if he calls her for his wife, Adonijah does, then he has a path to the throne. Even though Solomon has already been named king, and Adonijah goes to the, remember that previously on the first couple uh, pages there, he goes to the horns of the altar and holds on to, there was something about going to the to the altar and putting yourself in front of it. In other words, you can't kill me. It's a holy place. Yeah, we can. And there's, in the Old Testament theology, there's no reason why that person can't be killed there. And in fact, Solomon and David have both reasoned through this process with their soldiers. Um, Solomon 
In fact, we'll now do the same thing with Joab. Joab is going to go and put himself on the altar and say, you can't kill me. I'm, you know, no, 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 I'm in a safe place. And, um, and the guy's going to come out, Benaiah is going to come out and go, I don't, I'm not, I can't kill him. Right. And Solomon's going to be like, yes, you absolutely can go take care of him. And he does. So it's, there is no, you know, holy ground, safe place where, um, God's justice cannot be executed. And that's the argument that Solomon makes, um, because there's, there's sort of an idea, you know, and you get this out of movies and just sort of uh, modern culture that you can't do, you know, what's perceived as justice, God's justice. You can't do that in holy places. Yes, you can. Um, so Adonijah goes to Bathsheba. Bathsheba um, is, you know, someone who has the king's ear. He goes to her and he says, listen, I got a favor to ask you. And, um, and the favor is... You know that young lady that came in and was keeping David warm? Um, and I, I would like for her as a wife. And for whatever reason, Bathsheba seems um, pretty naive about this. And, and she says, yeah, I'll go in and I'll, I'll speak to the king on your behalf. That's fine. The king, my son. Um, David is dead. So she goes in before Solomon. Let's pick up here. Um in verse 19. This is 1 Kings 2, verse 19. Um, yeah. So when Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. That's an interesting thing. Um, she is his subject, but she's his mom. So he, um, he bows down to her, shows respect for his mom. And then he, he sits in his place. So as a person, he is, sub, you know, subjected to his mother. And yet, as a king, she is subjected to him. So it's a very interesting um, mutual subjection that is used throughout Scripture. Um, and especially, what, what's one place that you can think of where two people are mutually subjugated to each other? They're, they are under each other as term and in, in terms of authority well husband and wife um, that each one is supposed to be subject to the other and so here you have that same concept here the king bows down to this lady well it's his mom and so in a way in a very real sense he is subject to her he has respect for her and at the same time now he has become king and so she bows down as well um so he bowed down to her sat down on the throne he had a great or he had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. Um, right hand is a position of power and authority, and it's the same place where Jesus... So Solomon sits on the throne of God. This is an interesting parallel. Um, on the throne of God, as it's revealed in Scripture, who sits on the right hand of God the Father? Jesus. So here, the position of authority is... Um, is what he gives her. So he has a throne brought in for her, a special chair to show authority. And then he invites her to sit at his right hand. Um, she's, you know, I'm not picking at her, but she's no one of consequence. In a very real sense, Solomon makes all the decisions. She has no authority. And yet he invites her to sit on the throne and in a sense, share power, share glory. Uh, share authority and so that's exactly what happens um, so she comes in she sits down um, and it says I have one small request to make of you she said do not refuse me and the king replied make it my mother I will not refuse you so she said let Abishag the Shuma Shunammite be given in marriage to your brother Adonijah King Solomon answered his mother why do you request Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? You might as well request the kingdom for him. After all, he is my older brother. Yes, for him and for Abiathar, the priest, and Joab, uh, the son of Zeruiah, which is his uh, aunt. Um, then King Solomon swore by the Lord, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if Adonijah does not pay with his life for this request. And now, as surely as the Lord lives, he who has established me securely on the throne of my father David and has founded a dynasty for me as he promised, Adonijah shall be put 
to death today. So King Solomon gave orders to Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah and he died. That's it. So here is the fourth in line to the throne, and he makes a request, and and Solomon is already a pretty smart guy. Now he hasn't made the, he hasn't had this conversation with the Lord. That's on the next pages. He's going to have this conversation with the Lord where God says, um, tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. And we know he requests wisdom. But because he requests wisdom, then God bless him, blesses him with everything else. But here he is, Adonijah, fourth in line. He's mad. And what seems to have happened on the pages just before it is it seems that he submits to Solomon. And he hasn't. And he's still mad about it, that his younger brother has taken the throne. And so he sends uh, the younger brother's mom in and says, hey, uh, it's not his mom. He has no relationship with Bathsheba. And so he sends her in to try to get a sympathetic ear with uh, Solomon. Solomon reads right through it, as he should have, um, and puts him to death for it. Now, this isn't something that David probably anticipated, and he doesn't speak of it, but it is something, um, this is this is a way to secure the throne. It's sort of like when Bathsheba, so here's Bathsheba when Nathan comes to her and says, hey, they're crowning Adonijah king. Um, it's your son who's supposed to be king. What was Bathsheba's um, sort of paranoid request of David? They're going to put us to death if you don't do something about this. You said Solomon was going to be king. They're going to kill us. You see, she understands what's going to happen. If if this other young man ascends to the throne, all the other families get put to death, or they're at least at risk of that. And here she is pretty naively accepting the request of a, a competitor to the throne to take this young lady as a wife. She doesn't understand what's at stake, or she's too naive to understand it. And so Solomon sees through it, and he secures the throne. I, you know... I, you can read this morally negative or positive. Um, I mean, I see it as repugnant personally, but it's just, it's something that happened. And I, w I see it the same way that I see um, the multiple wives and um, as well the um, concubines. I don't, there's no authority to allow for that in scripture. And yet there's nothing that stipulates that they can't. Um, it's, you know, the marriage as we understand it is defined by Jesus. At that time, it doesn't seem to have been very clearly understood. And so it's just something that was allowed. Um, was it sin? I wouldn't go that far um, unless we find it somewhere else in Scripture. But it, it's not stipulated that way here. So <coughs> anyway, so in the next paragraph, so you have Adonijah is executed. Uh, Abiathar is removed as priest. It says, uh, this is 1 Kings 2, verse 26, beginning. To Abiathar the priest, the king said, go back to your fields. And Anathoth, that's a, that's a nice word, isn't it? I don't even know what. Anathoth? It just sounds like you're lisping. You deserve to die, but I... The reason he deserved to die is because he's usurping the authority of the high priest. He's clearly not from the lineage of Eleazar, so he has no authority to assume the high priesthood and yet he is assuming the high priesthood and David didn't seem to have the guts to actually work this out he understood and he get, and he's the one that brought Zadok up and gave him authority but he didn't remove this other priest and so you see these priests doing this conflicting thing Ad Adonijah's um, swearing in uh, coronation um, Abi uh, Abiathar is there, and at Solomon's it's Zadok. And so there's this conflicting high priest, conflicting generals, all the positions of authority up for grabs. And that's a dangerous thing to have. So he sends him back. He says, you deserve to die, but I will not put you to death now because you carried the ark of the sovereign Lord before my father David and shared all my father's hardships. So Solomon removed Abiathar from the priesthood of the Lord, fulfilling the words the Lord had spoken at Shiloh about the house of Eli when he was saying, your house will be removed. Um, Eli um, served as high priest. He had no, he was not supposed to be, he's in the wrong house. He doesn't, he's not supposed to be in a high priesthood. Um, 
Then, uh, top page 593, so 1 Kings 2, verse 28. When the news reached Joab, who had conspired with Adonijah through, uh, though not with Absalom, he fled to the tent of the Lord and took, ho took hold of the horns of the altar. King Solomon was told that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord and was beside the altar. Then Solomon ordered Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, to go strike him down. So Benaiah entered the tent of the Lord and said to Joab, the king says, come out. Now, so this is an interesting thing because um, the tabernacle was um, in most ways destroyed. Clearly, there's some of it left over and the contents inside have been recovered. Um, but if you go back into First and Second Samuel, you, hear, you read these stories um, where... Um, the Philistines ransacked the tabernacle and set it ablaze. So a lot of it has been burned or, um, you know, messed up in some way. It's clearly not what it was when Moses builds it 450 years before. Um, but, and they're building the temple to replace this. They're building it in larger proportion, but mostly the same way. God is giving all the instructions and dimensions for it and everything else. So when they go to this uh, place where um, the house of the Lord is, it's kind of hard to discern all of this. There is a place where some of the tabernacle, at this time, there is a place where some of the tabernacle, it's going to be brought up in the next pages, uh, where some of the tabernacle is. Um, but the ark has been removed from the tabernacle and has been moved into the city of David, into a different structure. Um, and it kind of seems like that's where this happens, um, but it's a it's a little bit hard to know for certain where these events take place. It the way the narration reads, it makes it sound like they're still hanging out in the city of David, uh, where the ark would have been, and we don't know about the altar. The altar may have been um, elsewhere. So, anyways, he goes to the altar, and he basically is trying to you know spread himself over the altar and say, "You can't kill me here. Um, this is the place where animals die." Um, and Benaiah enters the tent of the Lord and said to Joab, The king says, Come out. But he answered, No, I will die here. Benaiah reported to the king, This is how Joab answered me. Then the king commanded Benaiah, Do as he says, strike him down and bury him, and so clear me and my whole family of the guilt of the innocent blood that Joab shed. The Lord will repay. In other words, the, he's using the idea of the avenger. Um, which is, you know, is wrapped up with the cities of refuge and all of that. When somebody um, sheds someone else's blood, they are to be executed. When they do it accidentally, then um, they there is the idea of an avenger. So whether it was purposeful or not, clear our name by going in and taking care of this. The Lord will repay him for the blood he shed, because without my father David knowing it, he attacked two men and killed them with a sword. Both of them, Abner, son of Ner, uh, commander of uh, Israel's army, and Amasa, son of Jether, commander of Judah's army, were better men and more upright than he. Which is an interesting statement, um, considering what we know about Abner uh, and about Joab. May the guilt of their blood, may the guilt of their blood rest on the head of Joab and his descendants forever. Um, but on David and his descendants, his house and his throne. May there be the Lord's peace forever. So Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, went up and struck down Joab and killed him, and he was buried at his home out in the country. There you go. Uh, so remember what David told him about Joab. Hey, just don't let him go down, you know, down peacefully. And he didn't. So he went ahead and killed him. Uh, then Benaiah, who is the general of the armies, and Zadok, who is now the high priest, they are talked about. The king put Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, over the army in Joab's position, replaced Ab Abiathar with Zadok the priest. Then you read about uh, Shammai. So the story of Shammai is basically this. Solomon makes a deal with them, and he says, as long as you don't cross the river that comes out of the city, you don't cross the river and go towards your own home territory, I'll let you live. You can, you can live within the city of Jerusalem. Just don't cross the river. Three, three years later... Apparently, Shammai thinks that, well, it's been three years. He probably doesn't even remember that he made the promise. Three years later, he goes off because of this urgent situation, goes to his homeland. And when he comes back, he's caught by Solomon's men. And, of course, Solomon kind of set this up and because David asked him to. Uh, three years later, this is 1 Kings 2, 39 beginning. 
Uh, three years later, two of Shammai's slaves ran off uh, to Achish. So he was, he not only was he allowed to live in Jerusalem, but he was allowed to have a lot of his house there, including some slaves. Uh, they ran off to Achish, son of uh, Makkah, uh, king of Gath, and Shammai was told, your, your slaves are in Gath. At this, he saddled his donkey, went to Achish at Gath in search of his slaves. So Shammai went away and brought the slaves back from Gath. When Solomon was told that Shammai had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had returned, the king summoned Shammai and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you? On the day you leave to go anywhere else, you uh, can be sure that you will die. At that time you said to me, What you say is good, I will obey it. Why then did you not keep your oath to the Lord and obey the command I gave you? The king also said to Shammai, You know in your heart all the wrong you did to my father. So, Here's the thing is, if you tell somebody that you um, you did something wrong, is there need then for further stipulations of why they did it wrong? So like if you say, hey, here's the rule. This is this is what we're the two of us are agreeing to. And you broke that. Now, if you were going to make that person basically, you know, just call them because they didn't obey, you know, the terms of your you know oath or conditions or whatever. That would be it. There's no need to go on to further clarification. So when, and this is, I think, a very important point because when Solomon goes on and clarifies it further, it shows that he knows he probably shouldn't be doing this. Okay, so he says, You know in your heart all the wrong you did to my father David. Now the Lord will repay you for your wrongdoing, but King Solomon will be blessed, and David's throne will remain secure before the Lord forever. Now, Here's the thing is, we're not told what God thinks about this. We're not told that God agrees with this. And I don't want to make an assumption about that. Um, but the way Solomon acts in this, it seems like to me that he is, he's unsure. He's at least not convinced that just breaking the promise was enough. And so then he says, well, and also, I want to remind you, that you were a jerk to my dad. And so that's why this is happening. I mean, that in addition to the other. It's kind of, that's how it feels to me. And I'm not saying that that's 100% accurate. It's just how it feels. Because if you were going to say, hey, you broke the oath, you would just leave it alone. You don't have to further um, categorize it and, and explain it. And he does. Uh, which to me means that he probably understands this is not a good course of action. His, his father has advised him poorly. David, the man after God's own heart, is not perfect. And when he is dying, on his, dying, saying his last words, he says to Solomon, hey, I want you to make sure this guy dies. Solomon should have said, you know, I'm not going to do that. Um, you told me to do what God wants me to do. This isn't included in the list. Um, but he does it anyway. And so in a, in a very real, why I'm saying that is because in a very real sense, when, when the throne of David here's David, he's king. Solomon takes it over. And then Rehoboam. And as you go down the line, when you see the decline of the house of David, I just think it's important for us to realize David actually, he is the catalyst for that. That in most ways, David starts that. It's his own sin that causes um, the deaths in his family. It's his own behavior and his failure to be faithful to the Lord, that starts Solomon off in the wrong course. So there's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but David is not innocent in this. And if, and in fact, if you want to go backwards, you can see the whole point of David and Jesus is to show that David is a guy after God's own heart. And in some ways, he's exactly what God wants. But in all these other ways, he's not even close. That's why it's so necessary that Jesus become a man and do the things that he does because he has to live it perfectly. David doesn't. David still is a hateful person. David is still after vengeance. And so he's so close. What is he, 99%? But that 1%, man, it really wasted his family away. And I think that's an important thing to see as you study the life of David. Not because we want to accuse him and say, wow, he's a big jerk. It's just to say, he's just like the rest of us. You know, we're all like this. We don't live it perfectly. And so he just passes that on to his kids. 
And you know you do the same thing. If you have children, you know that all the stuff that you don't want your kids to see and know about you, they already know it. And they're already practicing it. And it's, it's a very discouraging part of life. But the reality is it was the same for David. And so David's passing on that sin to his kids. They aren't guilty of his sin, but they are learning from a sinner. And that's why the image in front of us is so important. We are made in the image of God, but we have to look to a better image. My dad didn't portray God perfectly. He did it better than me, but he didn't do it perfectly. And I'm not either. So we have to look to the image of Jesus Christ to know how to live. And, and that's really, I think, the point of the David and Solomon transition. Um, so then he has this guy, Shammai, he has him killed. Um, and you know what you did to my father, David. So that's the end of that. If you flip over to the next page, 594, 595, we'll kind of wrap up here. Um, Solomon, the... Subtitle here, Solomon's Blessed with Wisdom. Um, he's blessed with wisdom already. I mean, he's obviously someone who's pretty um, insightful. And so when things come before him, he's able to make a good decision. Here's the reality. This is what we know is different about wisdom. We always clarify this wisdom and knowledge thing, right? Knowledge is information. Wisdom is experience. It's experiential knowledge. It's, um, I've lived my, I can know all the facts about something and still not understand how it applies to a particular situation. And so Solomon's wisdom is something that has yet to be developed. He has knowledge and he knows when he's being played by his older brother. And at the same time, he takes the advice of his dad that he shouldn't have. And later in his wisdom, as that develops, probably he would have made a different decision. Um, and you, I think you see that, that sort of penitent attitude in him through the Proverbs. And at the same time, it's also the beginning of his fall because he does what his dad says and what we find here uh, in 1 Kings 3, you see the beginning of Solomon's fall. Here he is, you know, what, 19, enters the throne and just almost immediately starts to fail. And, and here's how. So, uh, 1 Kings 3, verses 2 and 3. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places. Now, we don't know exactly the word that's used here, the Hebrew word, is a word that could mean places of idolatry, and it also could just mean, um, it, it could be in reference to a couple of places that we know within the confines of Jerusalem, that David sit, uh, puts uh, places to worship because there's no temple. Um, one of them is in the city of David and one is outside of the city of David within Jerusalem. And so it could be that they're offering sacrifices there. We don't really know, um, but they are still sacrificing at the high places. It also could mean that they are sacrificing in the places that were worship places for the Canaanites uh, when they were kicked out. We know that they struggled with that. During the book of Joshua and Judges, that's one of the problems, is the judges were constantly going around and knocking down these huge altars. But guess what? When a, when a uh, mountain was known to be or believed to be some holy place, um, then the, it, it didn't get let go. They didn't just say, oh, well, the altar got knocked down over there, so let's not go worship anymore at Shiloh. Shiloh is still a holy place um, thousands of years later. So any of these places, you know, where there would have been uh, worship of idols, they still have altars. Even to this day, there are places where uh, gods are worshipped. And it's because the location. Um, gods within Canaanite history, and, and in a real sense, Israelite history, through the time of Abraham, the gods who they worshipped were lo location-specific. And so when Abraham goes throughout Canaan as he's on his way down to Egypt, one of the things that he does is he knocks down all these altars he finds. And he instead puts up his own altar and puts a sign declaring it, this is the, this is the uh, house of the Lord, or this, is, uh, this belongs to God. And he did that because the gods, as lowercase, as they're worshipped throughout the region of Canaan, they don't move from one place to the other, but God's 
but Abraham's God moves with him and follows him. And that's an that's a unique concept at that time. Um, and and even today it's still a unique concept that the dwelling place of God moves. Um, and people traveled for miles and miles and miles to get to Jerusalem to worship God because that's where he was. And they traveled for miles and miles and miles to get to Athens because that's where the God was. You understand? So gods are, are location specific. So that's still happening here. Um, people were still sacrificing at high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. It, this is an interesting reference I've talked about before. The temple is not made for God specifically. The temple is made, and the tabernacle was too. But the temple, when David talks about the temple and Solomon talks about the temple, it is a place for God's name. So remember that, because actually when we get into the, the building and the dedication, that's going to become an important concept. This is not for a place for God to live. It's a place for his name. Okay, um, Solomon showed his love for the Lord. You know, that I don't think that translation is very good. He didn't show his love for the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, and so this is his behavior. So it just seems kind of weak to say it that way, which is typical of the NIV. Thanks, NIV. Uh, but Solomon loved the Lord and walked according to the instructions given him by his father David, except, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. There you go. And so what you have in the, the small statement, 1 Kings 3.3, 3, by the time Solomon dies, it's full-blown idolatry. Every marriage that Solomon makes, and, and you're already starting up here at the top of that page, chapter 3, verse 1, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished the building, of, uh, building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the walls around Jerusalem. Guess what happens when he marries her and every other woman he marries? He also brings their idols to Jerusalem. And so... Solomon, the guy who builds the temple, who does the dedication, he is immediately an idolater. Immediately. He's building alliances. And in order to not cause offense to these alliances that he has begun, then he also uh, brings in their gods. So, um, then at Gibeon, all these sacrifices uh, take place. And then you have this conversation in verse 5 beginning, um, while he's at Gibeon, which is the place where the tabernacle items had been stored um, all this time, except for the ark and probably the altar, um, there really wasn't much of anything else there. Um, but here we go. Here's the conversation. This is an important conversation. 1 Kings 3, verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. So here you go. This is the genie in the bottle scenario, right? And except that you have the living God, the guy who created everything, is saying, tell me what you want. Now this, this is like everyone's greatest dream, right? I mean, God says to you, tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. And every one of us probably would say something like, you know what, I, I want to not be sick ever again. Or... Um, give me all the money I could ever, you know. So we would all be asking for things like that. Solomon answers, uh, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now remember whose throne it is. We talked about Sunday. So this is the throne of God. But you have given my dad, you've you know, blessed him. And now he has a son to rule in his place on his throne, your throne. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. So that's the second time he said that. 
These are your people. And I'm sitting on the throne, but I'm here to govern your people. Let me have discernment so that I can know how to do that. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, uh, for discernment and, uh, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will be, there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So there's the first part. Wish number one, granted. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor. See, there's two and three right there. So that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life as well. So it's four wishes, actually. Um, Solomon awakes. He realizes it's been a dream. He returns to Jerusalem. He stands before the Ark uh, of the Lord's Covenant and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And he gave a feast for all his court. Uh, this... This is the biggest part. It's the main part of Solomon's story. It's the greatest moment of Solomon's story is his recognition that what he really needs is just God's blessing of discernment. And God realizes, hey, if you're smart enough to understand that, then let me give you some things that are going to make your life a little bit easier. The sad part is those other blessings wouldn't make his life better. They would... In a lot of ways, they would, and, and this, I think, speaks to how God blesses us. In a lot of ways, a lot of times, it's very indirectly. And it's through things that we perceive to be blessing that actually could ensnare us. It's his, his wealth that kind of gets to him. And it's his name that people are attracted to. And they, they send these kings send their daughters to be his wives so they can build up alliances. These are blessings by God that in the wrong circumstance become curses for Solomon. And, and they aren't curses when they come from God. And yet Solomon's response to the blessing makes them so. This is a very important principle for us is that sometimes God gives us what we request and um, and it turns against us. Now, this isn't Solomon's request. It is God's way of blessing him. And at the same time, it shows that he is not the Messiah. It was David's son that would live perfectly and bless all the nations. But when Solomon has all of these things, they actually ensnare him, and he falls prey to all the temptations that come with the blessings. And so he shows, maybe even in a stronger sense than David, he shows how weak people are and whether they're blessed or not. Think about it. I mean, if you're someone who doesn't enjoy a lot of wealth and you think, wow, I really could use the blessing of the Lord. Are people who are blessed with monetary wealth, are they blessed? Ask them. Yeah, I mean, they're blessed in the fact that they don't have to worry about money. And that's about it. Along with that comes all the worry and the stress and everything else. And so here's all these things that we, you know, we put before God and we say, hey, if you just give me this, then I'll trust. I'll be right. And the reality is every one of these things leads to a problem. And you see it repeated throughout Scripture. Um, and so then there's this famous story that happens at the end, which I'm not going to read. But these two, what the Scriptures say, are these two prostitutes who come in uh, to the king's presence and they are arguing about this baby that they have and they're each saying, this is my baby. And her baby died. She rolled over on it and killed it. You know, So you have this very famous story. And then Solomon, uh, he hears both of their arguments. They're fighting over it. And Solomon says, hey, bring a sword in. And they bring a sword in, and Solomon says, cut that baby in half and give one half to her and one half to her, to her. And the reaction of the two women instructs Solomon. He sees it for what it is, that the woman who says, yeah, cut the baby in half, that works for obviously doesn't care about the baby. Whereas the mother says, don't kill the baby, she can have it. You know, And so Solomon ru rules wisely. He 
uh, this is something that, you know, nowadays we kind of think, well, everybody knows that that's what you should do. Yeah, you know that because of Solomon. Um, that was 3,000 years ago. Thank you for the story that we find in Scripture. Um, I don't know that that would work in every case and in every time and every place, but it worked then. And what God ha what Solomon had was the wisdom of God. He had the throne of God, and he had the discernment of the Lord, and it was a true blessing. And so who better to write the book of Proverbs to tell us about a perspective that is important? Proverbs is the positive perspective of wisdom and life. And Ecclesiastes and Job are the negative uh, perspectives of the same thing. And, um, and I would say this, that because Solomon has the wisdom of the Lord, he is telling the actual perspective. But you know that oh, it doesn't always work out for people who are uh, good. It doesn't always work out for people who live right. And you can see examples that are contrary to that. And that's what Ecclesiastes and Job show. And at the same time, um, what is being shown about wisdom is that it actually does work out. It may, it may not seem like it's working out for you, but it does. And not until the time of Jesus could people have the perspective that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. That's a New Testament idea. Now, it's Old Testament, but it's not really stated emphatically until the New Testament because most of us don't buy that. Most of us don't buy that the good guy wins. The good guy doesn't win, you know? And we know that from so many aspects of our life. The reality is that God wants us to understand that you do win. You may not win because people might, they may not change the way they treat you. You still might lose in this life, but you do win. And it's an important thing. Solomon could say the wisdom of God, but he couldn't live it. He didn't live it. And that's that's the sad part of his request. So David's request is, uh, I want you to uh, avenge all these people um, for me. And Solomon's request is, make me smarter than my dad. <laughs> and so you see some wisdom uh, preliminarily with him, but it doesn't last. And um, But, it, you know, these are still two great examples of people who love the Lord and are trying to please him. And when your life is condensed into four pages, it's probably not going to be a great, you know, it's not going to read well for anybody. So um, this is just, this is the way lives are. This is the way God's people are for all time. Um, but hopefully it's, it's still encouraging to you to understand that you don't have to live perfectly. Because that's what David's other son would come to do. He would come to live perfectly. And then he would volunteer to die on the cross so that you don't have to live perfectly. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Put every effort into it. Live well. Um, and at the same time, realize your salvation is not contingent on your perfect living. It's contingent on Jesus' perfect living. And that's why we get together on Sundays and praise him and thank him. And it's why we get together on Wednesdays just to have a reminder midweek to say, there are bigger things than what I have to worry about at work. I had a tough day at work, and I just need to put it aside and remember that God has promised me better things. So I hope that's what it's done for you tonight. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you on Sunday at the Extension Office in, uh, in Morgantown.